mechanisms we have for, for dealing with this complexity of financial incentives and markets and dealing with others and so on. So I don't think we'll ever have a single simple, simple theory. It would be nice if we would, but I don't think we, we would. Now, now where, where do these two will come together? Here's my hope. I think that economic economics should stay economics. Right? I think that the last two chapters of every introduction of textbook should include some behavioral economics, but economists should keep on doing what economists are doing. Mm -hmm. They're contributing, it's providing interesting theory and insight and analysis. They should, they should keep on doing what they're doing. Where things should change, I think, has to do with when we come to implement something in the real world. So if you're going to, as a company or as an individual or as a, as a government, you're going to implement something, now I want you to be more careful. Mm. Because theory could be theory, fun theory for its own sake, and it's an interesting intellectual pursuit. But when it comes to implementing something in the world, now I want you to be more cautious. I want to say how much of it should be explained by economics, and how much of it should be explained by psychology and sociology and philosophy. And maybe instead of implementing something based on our gut intuition, we do an experiment that tests which one of these two forces are more relevant in this, in this particular case. So, for example, imagine that we're going to try and create a new educational policy, yeah. right? And we want to incentivize the teachers and the principal and the students. How should we incentivize them? Economics has a very simple answer for this. Pay them. <laughs> Psychology has a more complex answer for this, which says that sometimes you can pay people and the result can actually backfire. Sociology will probably have a different answer. And before you go and implement something that would cost, you know, millions of euros, maybe it's good to kind of stop and think and saying, here's some inputs from psychology, from sociology, from economics. Let's do a couple of studies in trying to figure out which one of those seems to be the best, mm -hmm. the best combination. This would be rational. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it, it wouldn't be rational in, in, the, in the formal sense, because remember that in... In, in principle, we're supposed to know all these answers, right? This is basically saying we don't know. We're just going to admit how much we don't know, and we're going to try it out. Um, there's one typical thing about behavioral economics that makes it, for me as a consumer, very much fun. It's often counterintuitive. So um, what I learned in your book is that commercial ads in the TV um, make my life happier? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very surprising, but it does. You know, by the way, I think that um, this is the most interesting thing is how often our intuitions are wrong. Mm -hmm. It's really quite, quite amazing when you think about it. And, and maybe the biggest uh, irrationality of them all is the fact that we don't seem to recognize how irrational we really are and how much our behavior is not driven by what we think is driving it. So, so think about this issue of adaptation. <clears throat> Imagine you have a fun experience, something fun like a massage. And I'm asking you, would it be better if you took breaks in the middle? And people mostly say, no, it's so much fun. Why would I take breaks? Now let's think about something not fun. You're doing your taxes. Is it, is it good to take breaks in the middle? And people say, yes, of course I want to take breaks. And it turns out that the breaks are consistent with what people believe. So if you have something fun and you take a break, the break is unpleasant. Mm -hmm. If you make something that is not fun and you take a break, the break is pleasant. But what people fail to understand is that when they go back to the experience, the experience will be different than the one they've left. So here's what happened. You start a massage and the massage is fun. And over time, the massage becomes less and less and less fun. Mm -hmm. You start something unpleasant and doing your taxes, and over time it becomes slightly less annoying. You get used to it. This mm -hmm. is what adaptation is about. Now, this is the natural progression if you keep on being there. But what happens if you stop and take a break? If you have a massage and it's becoming worse, not as good, and then you take a break, when you get back to it, it's not where you left it, it's a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And then you go down a little bit and you take a break and you come back, it's a little bit better. And the same thing with negative events. 
something starts negative, becomes better, you take a break, get back to it, it's really miserable. Right? So, so what happened is that we have this incredible ability to adapt, which is both good and bad. It's good that we get used to bad stuff, it's not as good that we get used to, to good stuff. Um, but, but what happened is that when we take breaks, those breaks reduce adaptation. They slow down the adaptation process. Mm -hmm. So when we have something good, we want to slow down adaptation. When we have something bad, we don't want to slow down adaptation. So the advice is, when something good is happening, take breaks, <laughs> which is very counterintuitive. You watch a movie, take, uh, take a break. Uh, you're having a wonderful meal, take a break. Uh, you can you can think for yourself whether if you have uh, sex with your significant other whether it's worthwhile <laughs> to take a break in the middle or not. But but on the other hand, if you do something um, that is not good that you're not really enjoying, it's best to just focus and and finish it and not take these breaks. That's not tempting. Counterintuitive. <laughs> Another thing I stumbled over and was very fascinated with: what is it about self-hurting? <laughs> yeah. Um, here, here is the basic idea. Imagine that there are two ways for us to make a decision. We can consult our preferences, saying what do I like, what do I don't like, or we can rely on our memory and say what did I do before. It turns out in many cases relying on what we've done before is an easier path because what we've done before is very salient for us mm -hmm. while computing our preferences is hard. So think about something like a glass of water. How much is this worth for you? How much, how much would you pay for it? Very hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. Is it worth, you know, a euro, euro fifty, fifty cents? Really hard to figure out. How thirsty am I? That's right. And, and how much is this a pleasure that it will give to you? Um, but what you can do is you can rely on your memory and say, last time I paid X for it, more or less. <clears throat> Now, because of this, What we often do is we often rely on our memory rather than our preferences. Mm -hmm. So here is, here is the idea. Uh, imagine that you go to a new country and they have a new currency and you don't know much about what's going on and there's a new fruit you've never tasted before. And you end up, you end up paying whatever, a thousand currency units for that particular fruit. The next time you come to think about this fruit, what do you know? Do you know how much pleasure you derive from it? Do you know what's your opportunity cost? What else you're giving up? Very hard to think about. But you say, I remember what I paid last time. I remember last time I paid a thousand units, whatever it is. And you say, I always make the right decision. Last time was no exception. I must have made the right decision. Let me repeat that. And that basically creates a situation in which you can behave once in a certain way. And because you remember your behavior, you can keep on behaving in the same way over and over and over, even though the initial decision was not necessarily ideal for you. Okay, I bought an expensive car, so I buy another one. Yes. Now, with expensive cars, there's multiple things that happen. You got an expensive car, you get used to driving expensive cars. But beyond that, you don't go back and say, let me look at the whole range of cars and think about how should I spend my money. You say, I bought an expensive car last time, must have made sense, I'm in similar situation to what I was before, let me keep on doing the same decision. And this is all subconscious, unconscious. So, yeah, so you know, subconscious, unconscious, these are, these are tough distinctions mm -hmm. uh, to make because um, the, the kind of conditions under which we call some, something, right. uh, it, it could be... Is it aware? Is it unaware? Is it deliberative? I mean, there's lots of different terms. What, what, I'm, what I'm comfortable saying is that it's not a highly deliberative process. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you necessarily tell to yourself, I did this before, let me do this, do this again. It, it, there is something habitual about it. Okay. What I do not quite understand is the line between behavioral economics and social psychology. When I look in social psychology, there are even some experiments like the ones of Philip Zimbardo with, with the locusts, um, to whom they taste better. Mm -hmm. They could be from you. Where is the line between social psychology and behavioral economics? 
so so I don't think there's a line in the science. Mm-hmm. I think there's a line in the rhetorics and, and the models. And, you know, I, I think I do a little bit of both. I publish some papers in psychology. I try to publish something, some things in economics. Um, behavioral economics, I think... So papers are really in behavioral economics when they go directly against an economic theory. Mm-hmm. So you can have a theory of incentives and you go, you go directly in it. You have a theory that people have complete preferences or people have transitive preferences and you go directly in that. So I think those are clear. <clears throat> and there's also some things that are clear about social psychology that have nef- nothing to do with <clears throat> utility, for example. But in the middle, you're right, there's lots of things that could be phrased in either, in either, in either direction. And the question is just how serious are the people taking economics as a, as a starting point um, and, and what is the audience that this is written to. Um, I think that, you know, if economics was not so successful, we wouldn't have behavioral economics. <laughs> okay. right? so, so I think the reason you have behavioral economics is, again, is because economics has been the most successful social science mm-hmm. from a practical perspective. People are just using it all the time. Look, look around and think about what is policy and what is the legal system based on. Mm-hmm. It's all based on simple ideas from economic theory. <clears throat> now, the reason for me that behavioral economics is important is that I want these decisions in policy and business and government and law to be based on more reasonable understanding of human behavior and not just on the assumptions. So really behavioral economics for me is a a reaction to the success of economics and not a reaction to the actual existence of economics. If economics would have stayed in academic field, I don't think there would have been behavioral economics as, as would have become so, mm. so important. In, in the same way that we're not saying let's have, uh, let's incorporate, um, you know, psychology into sociology. I mean, sociology mm. is perfectly fine to describe mm. the things at the level that they are describing. But it's really the success of, of economics and, and, and the overarching claims of economics that, that worry uh, people like me uh, when, when we come to design markets, for example. Mm-hmm. So, so think about the financial market. Think about, think about healthcare. I mean, all of those things, right? It's really kind of disturbing that they are uh, created with such simple assumption of economic theory. This must be especially bad when you're living in America. <laughs> Uh, well, I think maybe England is even worse, but 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 yeah, it's, it's very bad in the U.S. There's no question. And also, in the U.S., there is this ideology of of Milton Friedman, um, which which is kind of amazing because you talk to people who never took a class in economics, and they talk as if they were disciples of of Milton Friedman. I mean, mm-hmm. people talk about. You know, the individual is doing better than the government, and it's always the case that in taxes and I mean all of those things, people have this ideology that is kind of really deep down and quite well uh, ingrained about the superiority of the individual over over the government, and the, mm. and of course now there's a huge tax debate um, in in the in the U.S. and this is actually very very disturbing. It's not much better in Germany, I have to admit. Thank you.